Join us for a thrilling podcast as we bring to life the casebook of Sherlock Holmes. This mystery story is sure to keep you on the edge of your seat and leave you craving more. Don't miss out on this classic tale from the casebook of Sherlock Holmes. We will follow Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they solve a variety of mysteries, from murder to kidnapping to espionage. We will see how Holmes uses his intelligence and deductive reasoning skills to uncover the truth behind these challenging cases. Join us on our journey with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in this podcast. The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes is a collection of short stories written between 1921 and 1927 and published as a book in 1927. It is the last collection of stories of the incredible detective Sherlock Holmes and his inseparable Dr. Watson. Through 12 other stories, as varied as an illustrious client and a Sussex vampire, a three-roofed house or problems of Thor's Bridge, readers will say goodbye to Sherlock Holmes through complicated cases that once again will test the brilliant mind of Holmes. The adventure of the illustrious client the adventure of the blanched soldier, the adventure of the Mazarin stone, the adventure of the three gables, the adventure of the Sussex vampire, the adventure of the three Garidebs, the problem of Thor Bridge, the adventure of the creeping man, the adventure of the lion's mane, the adventure of the veiled lodger, the adventure of Shoscombe Old Place, the adventure of the retired colourman. This podcast is perfect for fans of detective stories, history, and popular culture. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this podcast so that more people can enjoy it. Thank you for listening. Preface. I fear that Mr. Sherlock Holmes may become like one of those popular tenors who, having outlived their time, are still tempted to make repeated farewell bows to their indulgent audiences. This must cease and he must go the way of all flesh, material or imaginary. One likes to think that there is some fantastic limbo for the children of imagination, some strange, impossible place where the bows of fielding may still make love to the bells of Richardson, where Scott's hero still may strut, Dickens's delightful cockneys still raise a laugh, and Thackeray's worldlings continue to carry on their reprehensible careers. Perhaps in some humble corner of such a Valhalla, Sherlock and his Watson may for a time find a place, while some more astute sleuth with some even less astute comrade may fill the stage which they have vacated. His career has been a long one, though it is possible to exaggerate it. Decrepit gentlemen who approach me and declare that his adventures formed the reading of their boyhood do not meet the response from me which they seem to expect. One is not anxious to have one's personal dates handled so unkindly. As a matter of cold fact, Holmes made his debut in a study in Scarlet and in The Sign of Four, two small booklets which appeared between 1887 and 1889. It was in 1891 that A Scandal in Bohemia, the first of the long series of short stories, appeared in the Strand magazine. The public seemed appreciative and desirous of more so that from that date, 36 years ago, they have been produced in a broken series which now contains no fewer than 56 stories, republished in The Adventures, The Memoirs, The Return and His Last Bow. And there remain these 12 published during the last few years which are here produced under the title of The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes. He began his adventures in the very heart of the later Victorian era, carried it through the all-too-short reign of Edward, and has managed to hold his own little niche even in these feverish days. Thus it would be true to say that those who first read of him as young men have lived to see their own grown-up children following the same adventures in the same magazine. It is a striking example of the patience and loyalty of the British public. I had fully determined at the conclusion of the memoirs to bring Holmes to an end, as I felt that my literary energies should not be directed too much into one channel. That pale, clear-cut face and loose-limbed figure were taking up an undue share of my imagination. I did the deed, but fortunately no coroner had pronounced upon the remains. And so, after a long interval, it was not difficult for me to respond to the flattering demand and to explain my rash act away. 
I have never regretted it, for I have not in actual practice found that these lighter sketches have prevented me from exploring and finding my limitations in such varied branches of literature as history, poetry, historical novels, psychic research, and the drama. Had Holmes never existed, I could not have done more, though he may perhaps have stood a little in the way of the recognition of my more serious literary work. And so, reader, farewell to Sherlock Holmes. I thank you for your past constancy, and can but hope that some return has been made in the shape of that distraction from the worries of life and stimulating change of thought which can only be found in the fairy kingdom of romance. Arthur Conan Doyle, The Adventure of the Retired Colour Man. Sherlock Holmes was in a melancholy and philosophic mood that morning. His alert, practical nature was subject to such reactions. Did you see him? he asked. You mean the old fellow who has just gone out? Precisely. Yes, I met him at the door. What did you think of him? A pathetic, futile, broken creature. Exactly, Watson. Pathetic and futile. But is not all life pathetic and futile? Is not his story a microcosm of the whole? We reach, we grasp, and what is left in our hands at the end? A shadow. Or worse than a shadow. Misery. Is he one of your clients? Well, I suppose I may call him so. He has been sent on by the yard, just as medical men occasionally send their incurables to a quack. They argue that they can do nothing more, and that whatever happens, the patient can be no worse than he is. What is the matter? Holmes took a rather soiled card from the table. Josiah Amberley. He says he was junior partner of Brickfall and Amberley who are manufacturers of artistic materials. You will see their names upon paint boxes. He made his little pile, retired from business at the age of 61, bought a house at Lewisham, and settled down to rest after a life of ceaseless grind. One would think his future was tolerably assured. Yes, indeed. Holmes glanced over some notes which he had scribbled upon the back of an envelope. Retired in 1896, Watson. Early in 1897, he married a woman 20 years younger than himself. A good-looking woman, too, if the photograph does not flatter. A competence, a wife, leisure, it seemed a straight road which lay before him. And yet within two years he is, as you have seen, as broken and miserable a creature as crawls beneath the sun. But what has happened? The old story, Watson, a treacherous friend and a fickle wife. It would appear that Amberley has one hobby in life, and it is chess. Not far from him at Lewisham, there lives a young doctor who is also a chess player. I have noted his name as Dr. Ray Ernest. Ernest was frequently in the house, and an intimacy between him and Mrs. Amberley was a natural sequence, for you must admit that our unfortunate client has few outward graces, whatever his inner virtues may be. The couple went off together last week, destination untraced. What is more, the faithless spouse carried off the old man's deed box as her personal luggage with a good part of his life savings within. Can we find the lady? Can we save the money? A commonplace problem so far as it has developed and yet a vital one for Josiah Amberley. What will you do about it? Well, the immediate question, my dear Watson, happens to be what will you do if you will be good enough to understudy me? You know that I am preoccupied with this case of the two Coptic patriarchs which should come to a head today. I really have not time to go out to Lewisham, and yet evidence taken on the spot has a special value. The old fellow was quite insistent that I should go, but I explained my difficulty. He is prepared to meet a representative. By all means, I answered. I confess I don't see that I can be of much service, but I am willing to do my best. And so it was that on a summer afternoon I set forth to Lewisham, little dreaming that within a week, the affair in which I was engaging would be the eager debate of all England. It was late that evening before I returned to Baker Street and gave an account of my mission. Holmes lay with his gaunt figure stretched in his deep chair, his pipe curling forth slow wreaths of acrid tobacco, while his eyelids drooped over his eyes so lazily that he might almost have been asleep, were it not that at any halt or questionable passage of my narrative they half lifted, and two grey eyes, as bright and keen as rapiers, transfixed me with their searching glance. The Haven is the name of Mr. Josiah Amberley's house. 
I explained. I think it would interest you, Holmes. It is like some penurious patrician who has sunk into the company of his inferiors. You know that particular quarter, the monotonous brick streets, the weary suburban highways. Right in the middle of them, a little island of ancient culture and comfort, lies this old home, surrounded by a high, sun-baked wall mottled with lichens and topped with moss. The sort of wall... Cut out the poetry, Watson, said Holmes severely. I note that it was a high brick wall. Exactly. I should not have known which was. The haven had I not asked a lounger who was smoking in the street. I have a reason for mentioning him. He was a tall, dark, heavily moustached, rather military-looking man. He nodded in answer to my inquiry and gave me a curiously questioning glance, which came back to my memory a little later. I had hardly entered the gateway before I saw Mr. Amberley coming down the drive. I only had a glimpse of him this morning, and he certainly gave me the impression of a strange creature, but when I saw him in full light, his appearance was even more abnormal. I have, of course, studied it, and yet I should be interested to have your impression, said Holmes. He seemed to me like a man who was literally bowed down by care. His back was curved as though he carried a heavy burden. Yet he was not the weakling that I had at first imagined, for his shoulders and chest have the framework of a giant, though his figure tapers away into a pair of spindled legs. Left shoe wrinkled, right one smooth. I did not observe that. No, you wouldn't. I spotted his artificial limb, but proceed. I was struck by the snaky locks of grizzled hair which curled from under his old straw hat, and his face with its fierce, eager expression and the deeply lined features. Very good, Watson. What did he say? He began pouring out the story of his grievances. We walked down the drive together, and of course I took a good look round. I have never seen a worse-kept place. The garden was all running to seed, giving me an impression of wild neglect in which the plants had been allowed to find the way of nature, rather than of art. How any decent woman could have tolerated such a state of things, I don't know. The house, too, was slatternly to the last degree. But the poor man seemed himself to be aware of it and to be trying to remedy it, for a great pot of green paint stood in the centre of the hall and he was carrying a thick brush in his left hand. He had been working on the woodwork. He took me into his dingy sanctum and we had a long chat. Of course, he was disappointed that you had not come yourself. I hardly expected, he said, that so humble an individual as myself, especially after my heavy financial loss, could obtain the complete attention of so famous a man as Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I assured him that the financial question did not arise. No, of course, it is art for art's sake with him, said he, but even on the artistic side of crime he might have found something here to study. And human nature, Dr. Watson, the black ingratitude of it all. When did I ever refuse one of her requests? Was ever a woman so pampered? And that young man, he might have been my own son. He had the run of my house. And yet see how they have treated me. Oh, Dr. Watson, it is a dreadful, dreadful world. That was the burden of his song for an hour or more. He had, it seems, no suspicion of an intrigue. They lived alone, save for a woman who comes in by the day and leaves every evening at six. On that particular evening, old Amberley, wishing to give his wife a treat, had taken two upper circle seats at the Haymarket Theatre. At the last moment, she had complained of a headache and had refused to go. He had gone alone. There seemed to be no doubt about the fact, for he produced the unused ticket which he had taken for his wife. That is remarkable, most remarkable, said Holmes, whose interest in the case seemed to be rising. Pray continue, Watson. I find your narrative most arresting. Did you personally examine this ticket? You did not, perchance, take the number? It so happens that I did, I answered with some pride. It chanced to be my old school number, 31, and so it stuck in my head. Excellent, Watson. His seat, then, was either 30 or 32. Quite so, I answered with some mystification. And on B row. That is most satisfactory. What else did he tell you? He showed me his strong room, as he called it. It really is a strong room, like a bank, with iron door and shutter. Burglar-proof, as he claimed. 
However, the woman seems to have had a duplicate key, and between them they had carried off some £7,000 worth of cash and securities. Securities? How could they dispose of those? He said that he had given the police a list and that he hoped they would be unsaleable. He had got back from the theatre about midnight and found the place plundered, the door and window open and the fugitives gone. There was no letter or message, nor has he heard a word since. He at once gave the alarm to the police. Holmes brooded for some minutes. You say he was painting. What was he painting? Well, he was painting the passage, but he had already painted the door and woodwork of this room I spoke of. Does it not strike you as a strange occupation in the circumstances? One must do something to ease an aching heart. That was his own explanation. It was eccentric, no doubt, but he is clearly an eccentric man. He tore up one of his wife's photographs in my presence, tore it up furiously in a tempest of passion. I never wish to see her damn face again, he shrieked. Anything more, Watson? Yes, one thing which struck me more than anything else. I had driven to the Blackheath station and had caught my train there, when just as it was starting I saw a man dart into the carriage next to my own. You know that I have a quick eye for faces, Holmes. It was undoubtedly the tall, dark man whom I had addressed in the street. I saw him once more at London Bridge, and then I lost him in the crowd, but I am convinced that he was following me. No doubt, no doubt, said Holmes. A tall, dark, heavily moustached man, you say, with grey-tinted sunglasses. Holmes, you are a wizard. I did not say so, but he had grey-tinted sunglasses. And a Masonic tie-pin. Holmes. Quite simple, my dear Watson, but let us get down to what is practical. I must admit to you that the case, which seemed to me to be so absurdly simple as to be hardly worth my notice, is rapidly assuming a very different aspect. It is true that though in your mission you have missed everything of importance, yet even those things which have obtruded themselves upon your notice give rise to serious thought. What have I missed? Don't be hurt, my dear fellow. You know that I am quite impersonal. No one else would have done better, some possibly not so well, but clearly you have missed some vital points. What is the opinion of the neighbours about this man Amberley and his wife? That surely is of importance. What of Dr. Ernest? Was he the gay Lothario one would expect? With your natural advantages, Watson, every lady is your helper and accomplice. What about the girl at the post office, or the wife of the greengrocer? I can picture you whispering soft nothings with the young lady at the blue anchor, and receiving hard somethings in exchange. All this you have left undone. It can still be done. It has been done. Thanks to the telephone and the help of the yard, I can usually get my essentials without leaving this room. As a matter of fact, my information confirms the man's story. He has the local repute of being a miser as well as a harsh and exacting husband. That he had a large sum of money in that strong room of his is certain. So also is it that young Dr. Ernest, an unmarried man, played chess with Amberley and probably played the fool with his wife. All this seems plain sailing, and one would think that there was no more to be said, and yet, and yet, where lies the difficulty? In my imagination, perhaps. Well, leave it there, Watson. Let us escape from this weary workaday world by the side door of music. Karina sings tonight at the Albert Hall, and we still have time to dress, dine, and enjoy. In the morning I was up betimes, but some toast crumbs and two empty eggshells told me that my companion was earlier still. I found a scribbled note upon the table. Dear Watson, there are one or two points of contact which I should wish to establish with Mr. Josiah Amberley. When I have done so, we can dismiss the case or not. I would only ask you to be on hand about three o'clock, as I conceive it possible that I may want you. She saw nothing of Holmes all day, but at the hour named he returned, grave, preoccupied and aloof. At such times it was wiser to leave him to himself. Has Amberley been here yet? No. Ah, I am expecting him. He was not disappointed, for presently the old fellow arrived with a very worried and puzzled expression upon his austere face. I've had a telegram, Mr. Holmes. I can make nothing of it. He handed it over, and Holmes read it aloud. Come at once without fail. Can give you information as to your recent loss. Elman. The Vicarage. 
Dispatched at 2.10 from Little Turlington, said Holmes. Little Turlington is in Essex, I believe, not far from Frinton. Well, of course, you will start at once. This is evidently from a responsible person, the vicar of the place. Where is my Crockford? Yes, here we have him. J.C. Elman, Massachusetts. Living of Mossmore, come Little Purlington. Look up the trains, Watson. There is one at 5.20 from Liverpool Street. Excellent. You had best go with him, Watson. He may need help or advice. Clearly we have come to a crisis in this affair. But our client seemed by no means eager to start. It's perfectly absurd, Mr. Holmes, he said. What can this man possibly know of what has occurred? It is waste of time and money. He would not have telegraphed to you if he did not know something. Wire at once that you are coming. I don't think I shall go. Holmes assumed his sternest aspect. It would make the worst possible impression both on the police and upon myself, Mr. Amberley. If when so obvious a clue arose you should refuse to follow it up, we should feel that you were not really in earnest in this investigation. Our client seemed horrified at the suggestion. Why, of course I shall go if you look at it in that way, said he. On the face of it, it seems absurd to suppose that this parson knows anything, but if you think... I do think, said Holmes with emphasis, and so we were launched upon our journey. Holmes took me aside before we left the room and gave me one word of counsel, which showed that he considered the matter to be of importance. Whatever you do, see that he really does go, said he. Should he break away or return, get to the nearest telephone exchange and send the single word bolted. I will arrange here that it shall reach me wherever I am. Little Purlington is not an easy place to reach, for it is on a branch line. My remembrance of the journey is not a pleasant one, for the weather was hot, the train slow, and my companion sullen and silent, hardly talking at all, save to make an occasional sardonic remark as to the futility of our proceedings. When we at last reached the little station, it was a two-mile drive before we came to the vicarage, where a big, solemn, rather pompous clergyman received us in his study. Our telegram lay before him. Well, gentlemen, he asked, what can I do for you? We came, I explained, in answer to your wire. My wire! I sent no wire! I mean, the wire which you sent to Mr. Josiah Amberley about his wife and his money. If this is a joke, sir, it is a very questionable one, said the vicar angrily. I have never heard of the gentleman you name, and I have not sent a wire to anyone. Our client and I looked at each other in amazement. Perhaps there is some mistake, said I. Are there perhaps two vicarages? Here is the wire itself, signed Elman, and dated from the vicarage. There is only one vicarage, sir, and only one vicar, and this wire is a scandalous forgery, the origin of which shall certainly be investigated by the police. Meanwhile, I can see no possible object in prolonging this interview. So Mr. Amberley and I found ourselves on the roadside in what seemed to me to be the most primitive village in England. We made for the telegraph office, but it was already closed. There was a telephone, however, at the little railway arms, and by it I got into touch with Holmes, who shared in our amazement at the result of our journey. Most singular, said the distant voice, most remarkable. I much fear, my dear Watson, that there is no return train tonight. I have unwittingly condemned you to the horrors of a country inn. However, there is always nature, Watson. Nature and Josiah Amberley. You can be in close commune with both. I heard his dry chuckle as he turned away. It was soon apparent to me that my companion's reputation as a miser was not undeserved. He had grumbled at the expense of the journey, had insisted upon travelling third class, and was now clamorous in his objections to the hotel bill. Next morning, when we did at last arrive in London, it was hard to say which of us was in the worse humour. You had best take Baker Street as we pass, said I. Mr. Holmes may have some fresh instructions. If they are not worth more than the last ones, they are not of much use, said Amberley with a malevolent scowl. Nonetheless, he kept me company. I had already warned Holmes by telegram of the hour of our arrival, but we found a message waiting that he was at Lewisham, 
and would expect us there. That was a surprise, but an even greater one was to find that he was not alone in the sitting room of our client. A stern-looking, impassive man sat beside him, a dark man with grey-tinted glasses and a large Masonic pin projecting from his tie. This is my friend, Mr. Barker, said Holmes. He has been interesting himself also in your business, Mr. Josiah Amberley, though we have been working independently. But we both have the same question to ask you. Mr. Amberley sat down heavily. He sensed impending danger. I read it in his straining eyes and his twitching features. What is the question, Mr. Holmes? Only this. What did you do with the bodies? The man sprang to his feet with a hoarse scream. He clawed into the air with his bony hands. His mouth was open, and for the instant he looked like some horrible bird of prey. In a flash we got a glimpse of the real Josiah Amberley, a misshapen demon with a soul as distorted as his body. As he fell back into his chair, he clapped his hand to his lips as if to stifle a cough. Holmes sprang at his throat like a tiger and twisted his face towards the ground. A white pellet fell from between his gasping lips. No shortcuts, Josiah Amberley. Things must be done decently and in order. What about it, Barker? I have a cab at the door, said our taciturn companion. It is only a few hundred yards to the station. We will go together. You can stay here, Watson. I shall be back within half an hour. The old colour man had the strength of a lion in that great trunk of his, but he was helpless in the hands of the two experienced manhandlers. Wriggling and twisting, he was dragged to the waiting cab, and I was left to my solitary vigil in the ill-omened house. In less time than he had named, however, Holmes was back, in company with a smart young police inspector. I've left Barker to look after the formalities, said Holmes. You had not met Barker, Watson. He is my hated rival upon the Surrey shore. When you said a tall, dark man, it was not difficult for me to complete the picture. He has several good cases to his credit, has he not, Inspector? He has certainly interfered several times, the Inspector answered with reserve. His methods are irregular, no doubt, like my own. The irregulars are useful sometimes, you know. You, for example, with your compulsory warning about whatever he said being used against him, could never have bluffed this rascal into what is virtually a confession. Perhaps not, but we get there all the same, Mr. Holmes. Don't imagine that we had not formed our own views of this case and that we would not have laid our hands on our man. You will excuse us for feeling sore when you jump in with methods which we cannot use and so rob us of the credit. There shall be no such robbery, McKinnon. I assure you that I efface myself from now onwards, and as to Barker, he has done nothing save what I told him." The inspector seemed considerably relieved. "'That is very handsome of you, Mr. Holmes. Praise or blame can matter little to you, but it is very different to us when the newspapers begin to ask questions.' "'Quite so. But they are pretty sure to ask questions anyhow, so it would be as well to have answers.' What will you say, for example, when the intelligent and enterprising reporter asks you what the exact points were which aroused your suspicion, and finally gave you a certain conviction as to the real facts? The inspector looked puzzled. We don't seem to have got any real facts yet, Mr. Holmes. You say that the prisoner, in the presence of three witnesses, practically confessed by trying to commit suicide that he had murdered his wife and her lover. What other facts have you? Have you arranged for a search? There are three constables on their way. Then you will soon get the clearest fact of all. The bodies cannot be far away. Try the cellars and the garden. It should not take long to dig up the likely places. This house is older than the water pipes. There must be a disused well somewhere. Try your luck there. But how did you know of it, and how was it done? I'll show you first how it was done, and then I will give the explanation which is due to you, and even more to my long-suffering friend here, who has been invaluable throughout. But first, I would give you an insight into this man's mentality. It is a very unusual one, so much so that I think his destination is more likely to be Broadmoor than the scaffold. He has, to a high degree, the sort of mind which one associates with the medieval Ital, Ian nature, rather than with the modern Britain. He was a miserable miser who made his wife so wretched by his niggardly ways that she was a ready prey for any adventurer. Such a one came upon the scene in the person of this chess-playing doctor, 
Amberley excelled at chess, one Mark Watson of a scheming mind. Like all misers, he was a jealous man, and his jealousy became a frantic mania. Rightly or wrongly, he suspected an intrigue. He determined to have his revenge, and he planned it with diabolical cleverness. Come here. Holmes led us along the passage with as much certainty as if he had lived in the house and halted at the open door of the strong room. Pooh, what an awful smell of paint, cried the inspector. That was our first clue, said Holmes. You can thank Dr. Watson's observation for that, though he failed to draw the inference. It set my foot upon the trail. Why should this man at such a time be filling his house with strong odours? Obviously to cover some other smell which he wished to conceal, some guilty smell which would suggest suspicions. Then came the idea of a room such as you see here with iron door and shutter, a hermetically sealed room. Put those two facts together, and whither do they lead? I could only determine that by examining the house myself. I was already certain that the case was serious, for I had examined the box office chart at the Haymarket Theatre, another of Dr. Watson's bullseyes, and ascertained that neither B30 nor 32 of the upper circle had been occupied that night. Therefore, Amberley had not been to the theatre, and his alibi fell to the ground. He made a bad slip when he allowed my astute friend to notice the number of the seat taken for his wife. The question now arose how I might be able to examine the house. I sent an agent to the most impossible village I could think of, and summoned my man to it at such an hour that he could not possibly get back. To prevent any miscarriage, Dr. Watson accompanied him. The good vicar's name I took, of course, out of my Crockford. Do I make it all clear to you? It is masterly, said the inspector in an awed voice. There being no fear of interruption, I proceeded to burgle the house. Burglary has always been an alternative profession, had I cared to adopt it, and I have little doubt that I should have come to the front. Observe what I found. You see the gas pipe along the skirting here. Very good. It rises in the angle of the wall, and there is a tap here in the corner. The pipe runs out into the strong room, as you can see, and ends in that plaster rose in the centre of the ceiling, where it is concealed by the ornamentation. That end is wide open. At any moment, by turning the outside tap, the room could be flooded with gas. With door and shutter closed and the tap full on, I would not give two minutes of conscious sensation to anyone shut up in that little chamber. By what devilish device he decoyed them there, I do not know, but once inside the door, they were at his mercy. The inspector examined the pipe with interest. One of our officers mentioned the smell of gas, said he. But of course the window and door were open then, and the paint, or some of it, was already about. He had begun the work of painting the day before, according to his story. But what next, Mr. Holmes? Well, then came an incident which was rather unexpected to myself. I was slipping through the pantry window in the early dawn when I felt a hand inside my collar, and a voice said, Now, you rascal! What are you doing in there? When I could twist my head round, I looked into the tinted spectacles of my friend and rival, Mr. Barker. It was a curious foregathering, and set us both smiling. It seems that he had been engaged by Dr. Ray Ernest's family to make some investigations, and had come to the same conclusion as to foul play. He had watched the house for some days, and had spotted Dr. Watson as one of the obviously suspicious characters who had called there. He could hardly arrest Watson, but when he saw a man actually climbing out of the pantry window, there came a limit to his restraint. Of course, I told him how matters stood, and we continued the case together. Why him? Why not us? Because it was in my mind to put that little test which answered so admirably. I fear you would not have gone so far. The inspector smiled. Well, maybe not. I understand that I have your word, Mr. Holmes, that you step right out of the case now, and that you turn all your results over to us. Certainly. That is always my custom. Well, in the name of the Force, I thank you. It seems a clear case, as you put it, and there can't be much difficulty over the bodies. I'll show you a grim little bit of evidence, said Holmes, and I'm sure Amberley himself never observed it. You'll get results, Inspector, 
by always putting yourself in the other fellow's place and thinking what you would do yourself. It takes some imagination, but it pays. Now, we will suppose that you were shut up in this little room, had not two minutes to live, but wanted to get even with the fiend who was probably mocking at you from the other side of the door. What would you do? Write a message? Exactly. You would like to tell people how you died. No use writing on paper. That would be seen. If you wrote on the wall, some eye might rest upon it. Now look here. Just above the skirting is scribbled with a purple indelible pencil. Wee oui, wee. Oui. That's all. What do you make of that? Well, it's only a foot above the ground. The poor devil was on the floor and dying when he wrote it. He lost his senses before he could finish. He was writing. We were murdered. That's how I read it. If you find an indelible pencil on the body, we'll look out for it, you may be sure. But those securities, clearly there was no robbery at all. And yet he did possess those bonds. We verified that. You may be sure he has them hidden in a safe place. When the whole elopement had passed into history, he would suddenly discover them and announce that the guilty couple had relented and sent back the plunder or had dropped it on the way. You certainly seem to have met every difficulty, said the inspector. Of course he was bound to call us in, but why he should have gone to you I can't understand. Pure swank, Holmes answered. He felt so clever and so sure of himself that he imagined no one could touch him. He could say to any suspicious neighbour, Look at the steps I have taken. I have consulted not only the police, but even Sherlock Holmes. The inspector laughed. We must forgive you your even, Mr. Holmes, said he. It's as workmanlike a job as I can remember. A couple of days later, my friend tossed across to me a copy of the bi-weekly North Surrey Observer. Under a series of flaming headlines which began with The Haven Horror and ended with Brilliant Police Investigation, there was a packed column of print which gave the first consecutive account of the affair. The concluding paragraph is typical of the whole. It ran thus, the remarkable acumen by which Inspector McKinnon deduced from the smell of paint that some other smell, that of gas for example, might be concealed. The bold deduction that the strong room might also be the death chamber, and the subsequent inquiry which led to the discovery of the bodies in a disused well, cleverly concealed by a dog kennel, should live in the history of crime as a standing example of the intelligence of our professional detectives. Well, well, McKinnon is a good fellow, said Holmes with a tolerant smile. You can file it in our archives, Watson. Someday the true story may be told. Printed in Great Britain by Butler and Tanner Limited, Frome and London.